people are still popping in, we'll give them one more minute and get started. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, a couple of people are still popping in, but we'll go ahead and get started. On behalf of the Friends of Fort Hunter, I'm Barbara Dennison. I thank you for joining us for this uh, virtual lecture, the first in our 2023-24 season. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to have six lectures in that fall and spring season this year, like we did last year. Uh, which allows me to remind you of what the next lecture will be. On November 16th, we will hear from Bob Meehan from the St. Thomas Dulcimer Society. Uh, and he will talk about dulcimers and everything you wanted to know about dulcimers, uh, a little bit of history, a little bit of playing and so forth. And that's in great preparation for the uh, St. Thomas Dulcimer Society concert, which is part of Christmas at Fort Hunter. That is a free concert at the Centennial Barn on December 6th at 6.30 p.m. So you can mark your calendar for that. Uh, Katie, I'm getting a note that somebody doesn't hear anything. I, that might well be they have their computer muted, but maybe you can read that. Thanks, Katie. Uh, okay, so our next thing to sign up for is November 16th. I want to tell you that uh, our speaker tonight, uh, Ashley Leitzel, will give her presentation and we'll save all questions and answers for the end. And you will put them in chat at the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you probably can see that there. So if you type them in there, we'll take as many as time permits at the end. And if you have any other problem as someone ha already has shown, you're welcome to type it in there and we'll see if somebody in the tech group can figure out um, you know, what that problem might be for you. We are delighted this evening to have Ashley Leitzel with us. She is from uh, Local 798, I-A-T-S-E, and she'll pronounce that, uh, but it is the professional organization uh, representing people who work in her industry, uh, which has to do with the historical hair and presentation and so forth. Uh, and she was telling us in some earlier chat about uh, working in some TV shows and, and streaming uh, shows and, and films and so forth that people represent, but she has very graciously uh, last year and this year, and maybe some other times that I don't know about, uh, helped with getting those things exactly right for the displays uh, in the exhibits at the Fort Hunter Mansion. So we hope after this, you will be interested to go see this year's exhibit at the mansion. And I think she'll have a few references to some previous work that's been at the mansion before, as well as some of her other things. So uh, Ashley is a friend of Fort Hunter, and we are delighted to welcome her for this presentation tonight. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Barbara. Um, yes. So I first just want to take a moment to say hello. Um, I would just like to take a second to thank you, everyone at Friends of Fort Hunter, for having me both here, as well as to be part of um, your beautiful display at the mansion. I've told many people and I've commented um, to both the people at the mansion as well as friends and family about how absolutely amazing I feel the um, display is and how it's very rare I feel to have a display um, of such detail and quality as far as historical items that are being held in such great um care uh, oftentimes they are 
damaged or worn. And so it doesn't, we don't get to see those items in such pristine condition. So I want to thank everyone at the Friends of Fort Hunter for having me both here, as well as Barbara and Katie, our tech support, uh, for all of their help to get all of this going and figured out so that I could be here this evening, as well as, of course, a shout out to my connections at Friends from Fort Hunter, my father, who's on this call, Richard Leitzel, um, who has drawn me in over these past couple of years to be able to do this amazing work. And I really have enjoyed myself. Yes, Barbara was correct. I've done um, the museum display for the last two years. Uh, we did 11 wigs last year. We did, um, I believe, seven or eight this year. And um, I hope that you all take the time to go and see the beautiful exhibit, hear the information from um, the docents, because it's just, it's really a remarkable experience. So thank you again for having me. Um, just a little bit about myself as far as a background for you to see where I'm coming from. Um, like I said, my name is Ashley Leitzel Reichenbach. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree in theater arts. Uh, from Susquehanna University, which is up your way, because uh, that's where I grew up. Like I said, I grew up in Juniata County. Um, so while I live in New Jersey now and work predominantly in New York, my roots are from Pennsylvania. So um, I have my bachelor's degree from Susquehanna, and then my master's degree is in wig and makeup design from North Carolina School of the Arts. And that is where most of my education as far as historical um, hair, makeup, all of that kind of comes from. In that program, we talk a lot about design and design is really the key point in theatrical, opera, ballet, um, and television and film when we're creating characters. And so that's where that started for me was delving into the history of that, which comes from the world of costumes and the history of the evolution of hair as it has happened and how these things happen. And then how we translate that into Broadway, film, television, those kind of things. Um, so I have my master's degree from there. I am a licensed cosmetologist here in the state of New Jersey. Um, I worked in pretty much every form of theatrical uh, form you can possibly have. Like I mentioned, I've done uh, ballet, opera, um, Broadway. I was on Broadway doing hair for um, quite a few years, almost 10 years before I switched to film and television. And I've been doing film and television for probably about the last five. Um, so movies, anything from um, the Joker movies, modern, which is more modern day or fantastical to things such as the Gilded Age, which um, I was very honored to be on uh, their background team for a few years. I used to work on a television show called Bull on CBS. If you're familiar with that show, I was the hair department head for that show for a few years. So I've done everything from theatrical and period work to modern. Um, and I think that it really brings a interesting education to being able to do things both from a period standpoint as well as a modern day standpoint. And so today we're going to really talk about some of those things and how I do step by step in order to get from um, the idea to the finished product. And I am going to use the museum display as a great example because that's really what started all of this for for us. Um, I've taught this course to actors for many years. I've taught um, undergrad students when I was in grad school as well as I used to teach at the New York Film Academy um, actors and in how to basically develop their character and express that through hair and makeup. So um, we're going to talk basically about the actual display at Fort Hunter. Um, if we were talking about a play, um, a Broadway show, if we were talking about a TV show, then you would literally be going through the script and reading and breaking down each single character with all of the things I'm gonna be laying that out tonight. 
So for example, with the display, we did that in the same way. Now the display this year was especially um, very special, I think, because this year we had some photographs of the actual items that were being displayed, um, the original wedding dress and her wedding portrait and um, some of the other photographs. So we were in that instance, I was replicating that style. I was looking at a photograph, analyzing the information, using my research, and then creating a style on these wigs um, to replicate that photograph. However, in the same instance, we had a few other char characters, such as our um, first aid nurse and some of the other people that we saw, that we didn't have a photo to reference in that instance. And in that case, then we basically, it goes back to this imaginary character. We know information about them, and then we analyze it as we always would in other ways, um, as if it was new to us. So that's how we're going to kind of break it down tonight. Um, analyzing the material is our first step. So for us at the display, we were talking about time period, which is the building block of all of our research. Time period starts us off um, in just the base layer. So is it the turn of the century? Is it the 1920s? Is it the 1930s? That gives us a lot of information because every single time period is going to be a little bit different. And that's our very first step. Okay. Then we're going to start researching that time frame and connecting it with the location that we're seeing for the display. In this case, America. So if you would look at, let's say turn of the century, 1900. If you look at 1900 in England, you're going to get a different look than 1900 in America. And just to explain a little bit about how fashion worked then, because obviously in that time frame, you didn't have, People Magazine and the television to TMZ to tell you the newest styles. That wasn't happening, okay? So you were in, fashion starts with our royal families. Sometimes it goes across royalty. So for example, England's royal family will maybe look at France's royal family and they will take things from each other and change their fashion. Once that royal family has a style that they start to like, they will start to wear those things, having their modis and, and their dressmakers put those styles into play. That will then trickle down to their court, to some of their servants, the court's servants, and the people below. So all of that starts to trickle down. And everyone is basically trying to look their best and to look the most like the most fashionable people or the royal family of that time. Now, America is very far away and those styles have to travel from England to America, be it an actual person, people with those new styles coming across to America, or be it a, a pamphlet of the newest fashions or anything like that, a newspaper information from England, it still takes time to come across the sea. When it comes across, it's going to go into a major city, a major port of entry in the United States. Once it lands in that port, you're probably looking about a year in the past. England has already moved on. They're already doing the next best thing, but we're only, we're about a year behind. Now we're in a big city, okay? But then, the big city has to trickle out into the smaller towns, the West. It has to break down even further. So when we are designing these styles for each character, we are breaking each character down by their location. We're starting with that year. Then we're thinking location. And sometimes we don't have information on what was happening in America in 
Harrisburg, Pennsylvania at that time. We only know what was happening in England in that time. The best way for us to basically kind of figure it out is to backtrack in years. So in my industry, we tend to look, if it's a small town and say we have imagery from New York, I have imagery from a large city. I take it back about three to five years for anyone in a rural area outside that major city. And if I had to guess what that major city's look was, it would be from the dominant royal family of that country about five years in the past as well. So if I had to guess it, I would say about 10 years from England is going to be about the looks of a small town in the United States. Now, luckily, in this time frame, we've got a lot of photographic evidence to give us a lot of information, but obviously some things we don't have that information. And we're gonna talk about how we get some of those pieces of information when we get to the research section. So once we get our location, our time, then you have to look at social class. You have to look at race. So obviously in certain time frames our racial um, ethnicity is going to give us information. Obviously, certain, um, certain ethnic groups are going to look very different, be it culturally, be it um, just naturally a texture thing. For example, someone with um, a person of color with natural texture hair is gonna have a very different type of style than someone who is um, a Caucasian from a European descent. And if you watched the Gilded Age, you would see that. We see some of those beautiful, natural, curly textures trying to mimic the same silhouettes, the same shapes that all of the Caucasian women were wearing, but a different texture because they didn't have the capabilities that we see in today's hair designs. There are not, women in those time periods weren't necessarily, you know, silk pressing their hair and doing all of that. So those are things that we have to look at too. We have to research all of that, what was happening, the social class, the wealth. The other thing that really goes into wealth that is really fascinating is if you think about wealthy women and men, they had servants. They had servants to style their hair. They had servants to help them dress. They had servants to, to serve their meals, okay? So if you were one of those servants, you didn't have somebody styling your hair for you. You were probably styling it yourself. So you were probably trying to mimic the same silhouette as the person that you worked for so that you could be in fashion, but you maybe could only style your hair once a week. So you were trying to maintain it for longer. Whereas you were maybe styling someone every single day, multiple times a day. Because we're going to talk a little bit about that too. How every single activity had its own look and something that you had to like have this fashion. So oftentimes ladies would fight over ladies maids or that would be something in a resume that they would come to. Oh yes, well I'm, I am you know, I have the skills of the newest fashions. I have learned the newest styles. I know the newest updos. I know what is in fashion. I was trained with this person. That would be a very big boon in a lady's maid's resume to say, oh, I trained with this person in France. Oh, well then she's going to know the newest styles and be able to create them on me. So it was absolutely important that people were learning the newest styles and the newest fashion. And a lot of times it was from drawings or written information. Um, so that's something that we absolutely will be taking a look at um, in my favorite section, which is the research. So any hairdresser, <laughs> 
that is, especially a period hairdresser, takes serious pride in their hoard of research materials. So I brought out a few of my favorites and I'm gonna show those to you. Um, our research libraries are so important. We collect books, we collect um, old tools, photographs, all of those kind of things <laughs> are all super important to what we do. If we're talking about a time period before photography, those time periods, we would go back to literature, we would go back to art, we would go back to sculpture, we would go to all of those types of sources for imagery of what we would find. Museums are our friend. Um, and the only thing you really have to keep in mind when you are looking at art and you're looking at um, sculptures and that kind of stuff is we are all vain people. Everyone has a little bit of vanity. So um, if you actually read a lot of information about time periods, it's very dirty. It's very, um, you know, there was disease, there was famine, there was dirty. They didn't, a lot of people at certain time frames thought that um, bathing too much would make you sick. So they would not necessarily in reality be as clean and pretty and sparkly as we see in the movies, right? But to an audience, they don't want to see, you know, open sores and, and dirty skin. And it's not pretty. We don't want to look at that as an audience. And the same could be said for painters, sculptors. If a monarch was pockmarked and scarred and or extremely obese and looked terrible, what do you think would happen to that painter if they painted them exactly as they saw them? They would probably be headed or be put in jail or never used again in the very least. So they would put a wash of vanity on there. Um, and so that's why a lot of times we talk about secondary and primary sources as far as research is concerned in how you really have to take all kinds of like paintings and that kind of stuff with a grain of salt because it's probably a little glanced over and made pretty. So then for a lot of those time frames pre-photography, we go to the literature. And we have certain books like books like this, which is Fashions and Hair by Richard Corson, which is a classic standard book for most people in hair. I pulled up a few references of some information that I thought was some of the funniest information about beauty over the years. Talking about women in the 19th century, someone wrote, I once knew a lady who was bled from time to time to keep her marble-like whiteness of complexion. Others, to my knowledge, rub their faces with breadcrumbs as one should a drawing. So they were using all kinds of things. Things to things so badly as to bleed themselves in order to make their skin paler and more marble like. They were using lye on their skin. They were using all kinds of very toxic materials. But that is information for me that's huge. If I read that and then I see a, a painting of someone who looks absolutely beautiful, I'm like, hold on, that's not quite the same story. So you have to choose whether or not you would go with the truth or would you go with the vain, the vain look of it. Another one, <laughs> which was one of my favorites, came from an actual um, article written for people to start to learn how to style their hair. Talking a lot about um, the fringe, or for us Americans, our bangs, um, says in this article, who of us is there who has not grieved at seeing a friend, intelligent and pretty, making her look herself look stupid and ugly by an over heavy fringe frizzed like wool 
and made to come so far onto the forehead that there is a doubt that she even has one. I mean, they were brutal in these articles, but that tells us so much information about like a bang now is very fashionable, but in that time frame, maybe not. Now, let's keep in mind that we are not leaving the men out, okay? Someone wrote in this article, I never saw a man wearing a Van Dyke beard who was not selfish, sinister, and pompous as a peacock. Many men consider this beard artistic. I believe artists do affect it. The man with the pointed beard takes himself very seriously. So even the men were not um, out of harm's way in getting criticized about their facial hair choices. And so sometimes it's just going by information that you can find in a book. Sometimes it's books like this. We have a lot of this kind of literature. These things are all um, drawings. They're not photographs. Sometimes before um, photographs were, were available, but you can start to see some of the different styles that people are doing each day. A woman or man would have a different outfit for riding, for a walk in the park. Walking in the park would be something a little, as you can see, she's going to have, you know, her legs a little freer. They're going to have some short pants. Um, and each, each one of these cases is very different. We used a hunting gentleman in our display this year, which was a lot of fun. Um, and again, these activities, the men would have a different style. Women too, they would have a day dress. They would have a dress they would wear to go calling to see, speak to their friends. They would have a dinner dress. They would dress for dinner. They would have different dresses for balls. They would have a different style. Sometimes you're changing three, four times a day. Can you just wrap your brain around that? Changing your outfit three to four times a day? Of course, they needed someone to help them do the changing, restyling their hair, new accessories, a hat. Now, it's interesting when you talk about hats because oftentimes hats, when we think of hats, especially for men, we think of hats that you would wear in, you would wear outside, but as soon as you go inside, you take them off. But for women, women didn't take off their hats when they went inside. They would always have their hats on. They would always have a um, accessory or a fascinator in their hair if they were going to a ball. The men would remove their hats, but not the ladies. So you often will see that in a period drama of some sort, you'll see that the ladies still have their hats on. And that is a big misconception for people that, uh, I've had that discussion with directors multiple times where they'll be like, yeah, well, the woman would take off her hat. No, she would not. Not a woman. A man would take off his hat, but a woman would not. She would leave it on, okay? So we have those kind of same books for women. Pre, you know, pre-photograph, time periods, really great references. Sometimes they would have it in their trades so that women could see the newest styles and the newest fascinators, the newest hats, the newest outfits. They would show them how to do it. And in fact, later in, um, as we get more into what I would consider modern time, but unfortunately is now considered vintage, um, you know, 60s, 70s, they even did have styles that were in how-to books. They would send out leaflets, the, the newest ladies home journal on how to do the newest styles. Um, and then you could get it for, they could get it for their maids or for any of their, uh, whoever was styling their hair, or they could take it to their dressmaker and have the dresses made. Um, Here's another great example of a lady in an outdoor activity with her shorter pants so she doesn't get caught up, but still very, very formally dressed, especially compared to what we would think of today. Um, in today's stature, we would think of very expensive materials 
such as velvets and um, laces, those things would all be considered common ground for fabrics of the of a lot of time periods, especially turn of the century. However, like you'd see um, even color, when you talk about color, um, you know, like for us today, a little black dress or I mean, even black in general would be an everyday occurrence for most people in modern day times. In the turn of the century, you would not wear black unless you were in mourning um, because it was not, you know, it was not considered a common color to be wearing. And those are all pieces of information that we have to know for, um, for design. Because if you come in and suddenly someone's in black, I'm going to ask, are they in mourning? Are they not in, like, why are they wearing black? So the other thing we do with that, um, as far as the um, character goes, is that oftentimes we have to look at in the script or in the story, what has happened to that person. Sometimes you have a character that is like a tomboy, or is um, old fashioned, or they'll say something about that character. And that means something, they want to be able to visibly see that in the character as they walk on stage or on set. So maybe that means that they dress in a more masculine fashion, or they dress in brighter colors than is the common norm. Um, and of course, you always have to look and see if there is something that's happening in the storyline. Um, you know, if, if someone gets their hair cut, like if it, it actually says, you know, oh, it, she's, something's happened and she has her hair cut. Well, now we know that it has to be a certain length. So we're looking at all of those pieces of information in both the literature as well as in the research, as far as what kind of things we're looking to style into each character, breaking it down by each character, location, year, social class, race, um, any kind of personal, specialty personality uh, traits. And like I said, <clears throat> like I said, we did so graciously have a lot of photographs um, for the display, which was amazing. Um, so I brought out a couple of my favorites. So, like I said, I kind of collect photographs across the board. This is a tin type. I don't know if you can hear that, but it's actually on a piece of tin, which is kind of rare, but you can see so much information and like, they don't, they don't look glamorous. They're not, you know, they're just regular people. And sometimes you can only find imagery of people of wealth people of higher class will have, because most people couldn't afford to have their photograph taken. So when you can find those pictures, it's a very big excitement for me. Kids too are really hard for me to find. So when I find school photographs of children is such a big boon for me to like find those pictures. Or especially, like I said, photographs of people that, um, you know, did not have a lot of money is very rare. This is of a family herd. The last name is herd. And, um, they said this was, they died in 1911. So that photograph is, you know, probably turn of the century, maybe a little bit before, but those are not rich people. Those are just average everyday people. And that's the kind of thing that is such a great photographic reference for anyone. Some of these are like just people in their homes, people outside with their families, but that's such a rare, you know, commodity to have a photograph from that time. We also tend to use that for our photographs of our men because facial hair, like we already have seen, has was such a big play for men. They talk a lot about um, different things, especially if they went to war or if they came back from war, they would change the pride in their facial hair 
was so big for men. They would wax and go to the barber shop, and it was an experience to have their facial hair to be exactly how they wanted it. Some of these guys are my favorite. Every time I see a really big, um, you know, some kind of handlebar mustache, I get very excited. It's also exciting for us when we find a photograph of the back of someone's head, which is so very rare because most of the time you're facing the camera. So oftentimes we have to make up what's happening in the back because we don't get to see the back of it. Now, sometimes you see them in a drawing, but very rarely will we see it in a photograph. And sometimes it happens. Sometimes someone didn't want to face the camera. There was a lot of uh, superstition early in photography of not wanting, you know, their soul snatched by the photographer. Um, so sometimes they wouldn't actually take a photograph straight on. So you get some of these nice side photographs or here's another really great side photograph of someone being artistic, but um, very great information about her hair. Or this is literally one of my absolute favorite photographs. She's looking at the baby and we're able to see the top and the back of that Gibson. Now that's a Gibson. It's probably early 1900s, turn of the century. You start to see that silhouette coming in, going from more of a um, tight in the back wide side, which you will see in the exhibit. And then you'll see some of these Gibsons starting to come into play at turn of the century where they start to get a little bit wider. Gibsons were a really, really interesting style for women. Um, they often needed stuffing in order for the hair to stay inflated into that very round shape. So women would have hair bowls. And I don't know if you've ever seen a hair bowl. You might not have known what it was if you did see it. They were often porcelain small bowls that had a lid, a circle lid. And actually, I believe if I'm not mistaken, I believe there is one in the closet at Fort Hunter. You all should go there and look for it. There's a beautiful closet that I drooled over upstairs with all of her fascinators and hairpins and gloves. And, oh, it's just luscious in there of all these artifacts. And I think she, I feel like I remember seeing a hair bowl in there. It's a like a, usually a porcelain small bowl with a lid that had a circled cut out in the top. And what they would do is they would brush their hair because you have to remember, we didn't have blow dryers then. They didn't have um, all those tools that we have now. So they would sit in front of a fireplace and they would brush their hair as they, that whole idea that we used to talk about as kids, the brushing your hair a hundred times. Um, so they would brush their hair in front of the fire to dry their hair before say they would usually set it in rag rollers, which are basically strips of pieces of fabric that they would take a piece of their hair and put the rag at the end and roll the hair up like this. And then they would tie it into, you know, and you see it, there's a lot of like old imagery in movies of like people with little pieces of fabric sticking in their hair. That's a rag, roll, what you consider a rag roller. And then they'd sleep on that and it would dry overnight completely and they'd have curls the next day and it would help to be able to make their style. Well, they would take that hair out of the brushes and they would stick it into those porcelain bowls, stick their finger in the hole and swirl it like this. And what that would do is it would create what's called what we call a rat. And it's basically <clears throat> a tiny little ball of hair. And then when they were styling those very big styles or even as later when they had a, a bigger chignon in the back, they would take those balls of hair when they would need a little extra stuffing. And now it's your hair, it's your color, it's the same thing. And your maid would put it inside your hair to get that nice, beautiful shape. And that was such, so she most likely has that in all of this stuff, this area here. That's probably a lot of stuffing. She probably has either extremely long hair, which is also very common. Um, and or possibly extra stuffings of her own hair that her, you know, uh, herself or her maid has kept over the time frame, And then they can stuff it into that style, which is a lot of fun. Here's another, now we just use rats, which are um, 
made of netting and tulle and, and pretty much anything we can find. We basically wrap up in a hairnet and we make into rats for styles now. Um, this was just a beautiful wedding photograph um, of some people that were in that wedding party, but you can see such amazing styles and also the kids because there's quite a few, actually, I found a writing at some point <clears throat> today when I was looking through the material again, that said about how uh, children all had their hair long and curly until, um, you know, later in their lives until there, they became a point when their father would know, would want to know whether or not they were boys or girls. So before that, you probably couldn't often tell. And then at some point when the child was old enough to have interest for the father, then they would take a moment to cut his hair into a young gentleman's shorter cut. So those are all some of my favorite photographs that I wanted to share with you. I'm also going to share with you just a few of my favorite tools, which are vintage tools. One being this little clipper, which is actually a little bit later in time frame, but you think of men's clippers now um, with the electric. These were pre-electric. You would hold them like this and you would go up like this through someone's hair and the blades would slide together and cut the hair. So we would do combs and, and um, clippers for those. We have quite a few of those. Actually, funny story, uh, the barber shop I work at, we have a vintage one of these as a decor on the shelf. And I had a little girl one time come in and go like this and she was about to squeeze it. And I was like, no, 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 I, you don't wanna take your hair off at the root. So they worked very well, but can you imagine how tired your hands would be by the end of the day if you had to cut every single gentleman's hair with scissors like this all day long instead of the typical clippers. The other thing I wanted to show you briefly is a Marcel iron. So shortly after the turn of the century when we got into the 20s and then even more into the 30s, we would use irons in the fire. So basically what they were are a wooden handled um, iron. This is iron material metal. Um, and they would put them into an active fire. We now still use these for facial hair, but we use a small um, metal oven instead of uh, like an open flame fire. But they would stick this in until it got very, very hot. And then they could open it and put the hair in and curl it like a curling iron. The problem with these were that they would get up to like 400 degrees. I mean, it's a fire, it could turn bright red. So you have to have skill in knowing how to use these tools or you're going to burn someone or burn their hair off. So again, back to that maid who um, was trained in these newest tools was such a commodity to have for these ladies of wealth. Um, this one is one of my favorites. It's actually um, for waving. So it has the tongs here that you would close into the circle. And then when you push this, it pushes the iron forward so that you would get that finger wave action in the hair and you could iron it in and then pull it. You could start it that way and pull it back as well. Um, but that's like, you know, so hot and burning. We still use these today in silk presses um, for certain textures hair. We still will use um, the iron, um, but a lot of these now come electric. You can plug them in and they get hot, but they have a temperature control. Whereas before, um, again, uh, hairdressers that were first learned on these, they used to hold them up to their face because you could feel the heat coming off of them. Um, and whether or not, if you could hold it to your face and you didn't burn your skin, then it was okay to use on your client. Um, so when I first learned, that's my teacher taught me that, that you pull it out and he would hold it right by his face. And if you could feel the heat, then it was too hot. Uh, we later used some tissue or something to touch it. And if it turned the tissue brown, it was too hot to use. So we have that tool as well. Those are some of the like very um, simple tools that we still use to this day um, as far as compared to the styles of that time. 
Oftentimes we do go to a pin curl, a roller set, um, either be a wet hot roller set on a wig or something for a hot roller, like you would think of the 1980s perms. I have behind me one of our wooden blocks that we often build wigs on. It is a solid, it's so heavy. It's a solid wooden block. Uh, oftentimes, we would lay our lace onto this. We would pad this out to match someone's head shape. And we would lay our lace on here and use what's called points, which are tiny little pieces of metal. Oftentimes nowadays, people just use something like this, which is a canvas block that's covered in um, masking tape. This is actually one of our form heads from the exhibit. Um, and this is our tool to be able to put a wig on and style it before installing it into the museum. So we would take these, I would often use um, human hair or synthetic hair wigs for the museum um, or actually even for our actors, depending on what their hair calls for. Because a lot of times you're given actors who um, don't have exactly the right length that you need or have you know the color that you want. And, they don't do the same color processes as they would have done then. So we have to make sure that we have the option to change their hair color, cut, style, uh, without doing long-term damage to the actor's hair, okay? We did install those wigs with pins onto our mannequins, and we do go in about halfway through the exhibit to touch them up. When we go in, we have to make sure with my assistant's help to cover all of the dresses so that our modern day hairsprays and products don't damage any of our vintage clothing, any of the antique pieces. We, like I said, we're very careful with all of our, um, the longevity of these items because we don't wanna have any damage happening to any of them. Um, and we make sure that everything is protected when we're there. Once the exhibit goes down, then those wigs come back to me and they get washed and ready for our next exhibit, which hopefully will continue from now until who knows how long they will be exhibited. But as long as Fort Hunter will have me, I'm happy to participate. And once again, I just wanna take a moment to say thank you so much for having me tonight. Um, I had a good time. I hope you learned something. I hope it was interesting and fun. Um, I know I can just ramble on. So hopefully a lot of it made sense. Um, and please, Barbara, feel free to open the door to any questions, comments, concerns. Well, I want to say thank you very much. First of all, uh, that, that was very enlightening. And yes, encourage everybody to come see Fort Hunter Mansion, uh, which is open Tuesday through Sunday now until December 23rd. Uh, and there's all sorts of information. If you go to forthunter.org, the website, which I have put in chat about, uh, you know, how to uh, get a priority reservation or you can just show up and if there's space, go on the tour and see things. And um, maybe Katie will type in the cha chat for me. The current exhibit goes only through this December or does that come stay up until next May? Um, you're asking me remember. that? Katie might type it in the chat for me. I know that last year we took it down around December time and then the new exhibit went up in May. I believe this year we put up the yes. new exhibit here. So yeah, because we're closed in the winter. So December 23rd is the last day for the current exhibit. So everybody go see the current exhibit by December 23rd. Uh, we did have a question on uh, the sources and uh, you know another interpretation of the sources could be satirical uh, as Rec typically recording the exception rather than the rule. So how do you, you feel? Do you feel it's unfair um, to the people of the past to use these kinds of broad generalizations talking um, about some of the, the printed sources and other materials or the historical sources? Um, you mean like the books and stuff that we use for our research? I that think you? that's what the, the, the question refers to. Yeah, I, um, think, I think that that's a really great question and a really actually interesting conversation to have, which I could probably go on for forever about. But um, unfortunately, yes, 
I do think that it is probably unfair to not depict people in the historically accurate way. But again, unless you were there, there's no really way for us to 100% know that um, what is true and what is fiction. Um, like I said, a lot of what we we're trying to interpret what information we do have from art and from um, the written word, we are trying to do that. And to some extent, we are, we do take artistic license in order to make our audience interested in our information. And, um, you know, so that's the thing. If you really look at some of the time periods information, people weren't looked at in any way, shape or form the same as we look at people today. And our stereotypes from then are very different from stereotypes now. So we often are interpreting it in a way to reach the audience we are targeting. Um, I think that that's up to the interpretation of the viewer, whether or not that's fair or not. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's a very tricky balance, especially as artists uh, to do that. I think that the people that do documentaries and things about real people in real lives have an even trickier, um, you know, job to be able to depict that information. And some of that happens, you know, even with the photographs from the museum, you know, I did my absolute best to replicate what we saw in those photographs, but is it exactly the same? Probably not. Cause I wasn't there. So, um, you know, I think we just do the best we can and hopefully we got pretty close. Uh, I think a little more personal question. What is your next project? And it, will there be another season of Gilded Age? Gotcha. Um, the most recent project I was on right before this was American Horror Stories, which is actually going to be airing on Hulu um, in a few weeks. I believe it's October 26th. It airs on Hulu. The first four episodes, um, for those who don't know, the actors are currently on strike. So we have been unemployed for a few months. Um, so before this, I was working on that. We were up to, uh, we had finished episode four, uh, hadn't started up. Well, we started episode five, but hadn't finished. So hopefully we'll be going back to finish five through however many else they give us. Um, will there be another season of Gilded Age? Gosh, I hope so. I sure did love working on that show. Um, some of my dearest friends are on that show and um, on that hair team. And it was really a beautiful show. Uh, I unfortunately do not have a crystal ball, so I cannot tell you if it's going to happen or not, because it's not up to me. But if it is up to me, I say, please, yes, I hope so, because I loved it. I loved working on it and I loved watching it. And what does your research show about how people of color did their hair during that period? That would have been before Madam C.J. Walker's time. It would be before Madam C.J. Walker's time, yes. Um, a lot of times when you look at that, you would start to see some um, of the hot iron type situations starting to happen for some people of color in that time frame. A lot of products, which um, we didn't really get into because I don't have a lot of information about that, but Madam C.J. Walker is a brilliant um, woman of color who started, did a lot for hair care in general. Um, but a lot of those products would have been made with like products of nature, things like lards and waxes and stuff. So you would have seen a lot of that trying to tame um, curl, but you wouldn't have seen, um, you know, the straight and that kind of stuff, because it just, it just wasn't, they weren't capable of that, you know, that was before chemical processing and everything like that. We weren't getting into jerry curls and chemical straightenings or any of that at that time frame, as far as Gilded Age, like turn of the century time. So you would have seen a lot more natural textures, maybe some hot tool action um, for some like almost like silk press uh, information. Um, but yeah, they really, you know, I, I feel, and I feel like Gilded Age has done a beautiful job on that. Uh, the department head for that show, uh, Sean Flanagan, has been amazing at making sure that those characters, those women of color, men of color, are being depicted in the way that they, you know, they really were. And with the tools and the available things they had versus what maybe we as a society now in 2023 would have um, styled like their hair in nowadays, but. Aside from the obvious Fort Hunter exhibit, uh, what has been your favorite project to work on? Ooh, my favorite project to work on. Aside from Fort Hunter, of course. 
I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie. I have to say I was the uh, department head on an American in Paris in uh, on Broadway for uh, that show has a very dear place in my heart. Uh, I was actually had the opportunity to go to Paris and see the show when it was put in the Paris Opera House and learn the show there and then bring it back to New York and mount it here. And I was honored to do that show for over two years on Broadway in New York. And it really probably to this day has been the pinnacle of my, definitely my theater career, maybe my entire career to, to date, so. Um, I, I was interested if there's any way, uh, there, that, like, a different way that you would deal with depicting uh, indigenous people's Native American First Nation hair um, in the period we're talking about. I, you know, I'm thinking of how the pictures we have from Carl Indian School and so forth of them trying to take, you know, that hair and turn it into looking like little Anglo-Saxon Caucasian kids hair um, as children. Is, is, there, mm -hmm. is there something different about when you, you need to depict um, that particular, and, and all of that uh, hair arrangement, accoutrement, um, decorations you know, that go along with all of the various nations. Or, I mean, uh, to be honest, if we were talking about a project that that came up to, I would probably delve extremely deep into that. I find anything that has to do with Native American um, history to be absolutely fascinating. Um, and I'm not at this point uh, educated enough to say that I would change anything. I think that their traditions and uh, their tribe ancestors did their hair the way that it was meant to be at that time. I would just probably dive straight into that re research and do it as true to their fashion as possible. Um, Native American hair is a very, uh, not to be scientific, but it is a large shaft style um, of hair, like versus like, for example, my hair, which is more of European hair has a very much smaller um, shape of the actual follicle. So because of that, their hair is much stronger and that's why they can, you know, grow their hair very, very long. And it, it always has that like beautiful glossy shine to it that you, that you see in a lot of those tribal um, styles. But I can't say that I would personally change anything. I just know that I would delve like a hundred percent into all that research and get as much information as I possibly can so that it continues to be kept true to their heritage. I think that that's the thing that's probably, um, that's the thing that's really hard for, uh, for artists is that there's a difference between trying to, um, put an artistic spin on it and make it a, an art piece through hair versus like staying really true. Uh, I'm a firm believer in keeping that history alive. So I think if, if anything, I would just love to dive deep into that um, in all their hair practices and be able to help continue it on into the future would be great. Preserve it the best we could. So um, well, I think that's a great point to end on. It's almost eight o'clock and uh, I don't see any more questions. Although there are quite a few uh, accolades in the chat about oh, good. interesting and thoughtful presentation and thank you and uh, that was great and learned a lot so you know all those great things are in the chat uh, if you don't get a chance to see those but thank you everyone for joining us please go ahead and register if the registration isn't open yet it soon will be um, I haven't checked it yet for the November 16th lecture with uh, Bob Behan about the dulcimers check out fort100.org for Christmas at Fort Hunter, there's all sorts of things. Um, you know, most of them are free that you can do various weekends or only one specific weekend for all ages during that uh, uh, time of year. So we invite you to check that out. And of course, come visit the mansion before this display goes down on December 23rd. Thank you everyone.